So it's great to be here. And first of all, disclaimer, I'm blind. And so Zoom is always tricky because I have no idea where the camera is. So I try to stay centered, but if my eyes drift, I apologize. And also uh, I'm doing slides. So hopefully today the slides that I'm talking about are actually on the screen <laughs> because I memorize all of them. So just be patient with me on that. And just love the work that this group does. Was learning a little bit uh, ahead of time the impact you guys are having. Randy and I have talked about you in the past, and and uh, I've studied agile and did implementations with it back in a former job position of mine. So grateful to be here, and I hope I can provide value. I'm going to go through some concepts, and if you have questions throughout it, it can just be a very informal discussion. You can um, submit questions, and we'll go from there. So. Mason mentioned that I do what's called theory of constraints, which can definitely be very complementary to, to Agile, but it's essentially a body of knowledge to help us think clearly. We're all inundated with a million things every day we could do. Lots of ideas, lots of problems to solve, lots of opportunities, and it can feel one a bit overwhelming. But the other thing we have to be, I think, mindful of is that we have finite time and attention. And it's the thing I fight against most of my life because you know we all want to do a million things. But when we face that harsh reality, we only have so much time and attention. It becomes really important to get clear and be confident that we're solving the right problem in our organizations, and this, you know, which ultimately should be solving significant and meaningful problems for the people we serve. And having been in this space for a long time and worked in a lot of different settings. I've seen these trends happen where people, instead of solving the right problem are solving tangential problems or problems that give them what's called the illusion of progress. They're successful in making a change, but when you look at the impact at the end of the day, that the change isn't meaningful. And I've, I wrote this book with a colleague and it's all about what to not do. And we found if we can get people to stop focusing on these things, they can start focusing on the things that really matter and can become more successful in their own careers and their own teams. They can have a bigger impact uh, for the people they serve. I think just be more effective in, in the workplace and hopefully in their personal lives as well. So let me just give you one other genesis of how this came. When I was over the office management budget for Governor Herbert for eight years, we would get lots of budget requests because I had to do the budget. And I started to come up with these just these trends. People would come ask for more money and all these things. And I would be looking at what they're doing and what their plans are, et cetera. And I started to see these trends. I first called them the fatal four. And then after a couple more years, saw a few more trends. And that's how we came up with what's called the seductive seven. And the seductive seven are changes we try to make or solutions we chase are usually jump to and they're give us the illusion of progress but they're not the problem to solve and our belief is that the breakthrough the innovation happens not when we jump to a new solution but when we redefine the problem and so i spend if i, I my belief is that if we can get the problem correct um the solution's much much easier but i rather an organization go slow and spend 70 percent of their time understanding the problem and then the rest just implementing um implementing it because usually the problem is not very obvious in terms of it's very deeper and it's really connected to the customer. So I'm gonna go through the seductive seven today, what the illusion is, some examples of it. So you can see how it shows up and hopefully it's relevant to you and your work life. And one of them is more technology. I'm not opposed to technology, I actually love it, but we'll talk about when and how um, technology can be impactful in all of this. And by the way, none of these things by themselves are wrong. They're just tactics. They're not by themselves the solution. We may pull some of these into our solution, but by themselves, they'll never ever be the solution or at least get you kind of the breakthroughs you want. If I'm in an organization and we're getting like a one or two or 5% improvement, to me, we're solving the wrong problem. When you know you're solving the right problem and you're not just chasing the latest idea or a hunch, you usually can get 25, 100. I've seen organizations get 300% improvement. So. That's the, that's the big picture for today. So let's first go through the, what the seductive seven are. Um, the, and then I'll go through each one in these more detail, but we believe we need more money. We believe we need more data. We believe we need another reorg. Um, in the private sector, my, my co-author who wrote this with me, he's uh, big in the private sector. And so 
and I've done some consulting in the private sector as well. So you know, this is applicable wherever you are. This isn't just government. It's wherever you are, these are true. So in reorg, sometimes that's mergers and acquisitions. Um, we believe that we need more technology. We need a new strategic plan. We need a new uh, training protocol, or we need uh, you know, more accountability on our staff. So let me go through all of these in turn. And let me start with more money. Now, at the end of the day, everything we do is founded upon an assumption, a belief, something that we believe that causes us to act in a certain way. So we're always interested in looking at what must people be thinking or believing for them to take this action. So when it comes to more money, the illusion we have is that we're already doing as much as we can with the resources we have. We're already super effective, super efficient, and the only way out of this is more money. And I, and I empathize with that. Like there is a point when you actually may need more money, but when you know that money is limited and it's not endless and you can't just go to your boss and ask for you know, a million dollar expansion, we want to make for, first make sure that we're solid and really confident that we're doing all we can with the resources that we have. And so the right mindset we really want to have is that we can always do more. There's hidden capacity. There's, you know, that's a whole different lecture of how to find and use this hidden capacity, but there's hidden capacity in our organizations. And the challenge is if we don't believe it's there, if we believe we're as good as we can get, um, we'll never go look for it. I always talk about we find what we search for and we search for what we believe exists. And if we don't believe there's hidden capacity, we'll never find it. We jump to more money and having run the budget, you know, there just is limited money. Uh, there isn't enough to go around all the requests coming in. So in your own work or in your own workplaces, you know, I found for people in my shop who got the attention were those folks who could get breakthrough results with the resources they had. And when they did come ask for more money, they had credibility because they had already demonstrated competence with the resources they have. There's a great quote by Jim Collins. I'm sure you all know it. The enemy of the great is the good. And um, we have good government, good schools, good workplaces, because we don't believe in great. We don't have this higher standard sometimes. And that requires us to do something we haven't done before. This next cartoon I love, even though I can't see it. It's an, a man with, you know, you can see it. I don't have to explain it to you, side if you can't you see it. He doesn't know how to use the resources he has, so more of them won't help. And I think a lot of approaches from waterfall to agile to now DevOps, et cetera, are all in very good ways trying to get more out of the resources we have. How do we get bigger impact with the resources we have? In fact, by the way, DevOps is founded on theory of constraints. You guys have read the Phoenix Project, it's interesting stuff. So let me just give you a couple we have endless examples. I've worked in probably maybe now 235, 40 systems, and each one I've been in has had significant opportunity to get better with the resources they have. It's hard. It's it's not some easy work. It's you know takes some time and effort, but there's usually a lot of hidden capacity there. So, for example, um, when I was running. Um, well, there's so many examples, I didn't even know where to start. <laughs> we had a, a group with juvenile, I, it's juvenile justice services. So these are kids who were in prison detention, essentially. You know, the hard, sad cases. You know, these kids, they're, they're going to go to the prison or they're going to take another route. A lot of pressure on that organization. And they had an audit that didn't look favorable for them. And sometimes the first thing was, hey, we need to hire more staff. We need to hire more resources. We need to introduce a new evidence-based model. So we went into their organization, and there's a lot of stuff you know that happened there. But what was really interesting, in fact, Randy, you know what I'm going to do here? Will you pull up ABCDE? Is there a way to pull that up? Second. Randy's going to pull up a slide. I just want to show it. Sorry, it's going to be a little. But basically, because they didn't function as a system, they were more worried about how each part works separately, not how all the parts work together. And the breakthroughs happen when we understand how the parks, parts work together, not how they work separately. And so when we went into the system and we looked at the front end, what happened in the detention, what happened after the kids left detention with transition, when we looked at the big picture and not just a piece of it, we could see that there was significant capacity to shift and move resources around. And we're gonna, I wanna show you this slide this, that will kind of illustrate this point because if we don't, 
get this piece right, it's very easy to fall into the trap that we just need more money. So when Randy pulls this up, and essentially it's the basis of what we call systems thinking. And this slide, it's he's pulling it, is up. Um, it has five parts. It's a very fundamental, simple slide. I know this, but this point, even in juvenile justice system or a prison system, things like that that aren't so flow oriented, we think they're not flow oriented, but they actually are. Um, there's capacity. So here's a slide you can see A, B, C, D, E. Um, this represents a very simple system. Five different people, they have different roles, responsibilities, different capabilities. And A can do 20 hours, or A can do 20 units an hour. B can do 16 units an hour. C can do 10 units an hour. C can do, do we have 24, 24 units an hour and then 18, right. 18 units an hour. So a lot of variation. Uh, and this is how the workplace is, right? There's a lot of variation, different types of things that need to happen. And what we tend to do is try to go optimize or fix each one of these pieces. When we went to JJS, this was the same layout, not quite as simple, but concepts similar. Now, if you're in an organization, you could go try to improve everything here, but you can't, you don't have time or resources. So the question is, where do you, where do you improve? But let me ask you this question first. If I were to put 100 units of work, Mason, you can't answer this. If I were to put 100 units of work in front of A, at the end of the hour, how many units of work could this system produce? Any guesses? You can put it in the chat if you have a thought about it. How many, how many units of work can this system actually well, produce? Alan did put an answer in the chat and- okay. It says 10. Good job, Alan. Exactly. Now, that seemed obvious to Alan. It may not seem obvious to all of you. So let's walk through it. Well, I'll be in a group of you know, 50 people and some get it, some struggle. A lot of times people will count up the five pieces and average it out or they'll just make a random guess. But here's the deal. If I have A, you can do 20 units and I shift it to B, who can do 16. Even though A sent 20, B can only do 16. So now I've got some units of work just sitting there in inventory, which is people waiting for services, projects in the IT world waiting to be completed that aren't completed. User stories. User stories in your world, yep. It goes to C, C can only do 10 units. So now I give C 16 units, but C can only do 10. So now I have another six user stories waiting to be worked on. And C hands off 10 to D and E, and even though D and E have much more capacity, they actually only work on 10 units because that's what they've been given. And a lot of times in our organizations, if we don't go up a level to see the bigger picture, we get lost in the weeds pretty quickly. We get lost in the detail. So we'll go do big IT or improvement projects or new training modules or whatever on A, and we can improve A, but it doesn't matter because the system didn't improve. And in fact, I could actually make things worse. I could force more projects down a system that doesn't have capacity and create a lot more backlog, which creates quality problems, rework issues. There's a lot of challenges. I'm sure you guys face that as the business side throws IT to you guys, then you're already overwhelmed. You can't finish what you have, only work comes in. And all of a sudden the system starts to slow down. So when we understand this principle and we understand how do I get the parts to work together here, so that I can get continuous flow, that was really the basis of DevOps, I can get significant capacity with no new resources. So if you were a manager of this system, what are a couple things you could do without asking for any more money to get a big jump in performance? You have total control of the system. What's one or two things you could do here just to make this better? What do you think? And you can put your answer in the chat. I'll give you the answer as you think about it. I could take resources from D, and this is what we did in juvenile justice services, and shift it to the constraint, to A. I mean, to C. And actually, we did end up moving some up to A for prevention so we could help prevent folks from kids coming in in the first place. But we shifted resources around. The other thing we did is we offloaded work from C. C shouldn't be doing anything um, other than what's exactly related to what C should be doing. So we offloaded work 
from what we call the case managers in the detention center so that they could spend more focused time with these kids. And we got a big jump in improvement for these kids with recidivism. So offloading work to other parts of the organization that have capacity, bringing capacity in where the capacity is needed. And if we don't take this higher perspective on our work, we can locally optimize. I can improve A, I can improve B, D, E, and the system doesn't improve. We spent money, we're overwhelmed, we're super busy. You know, we set up reports to track where our projects are and how far behind and change orders. And you got two years of change order requests and it goes on and on. And it's because we just didn't start from the very basic foundational knowledge. The work we do, and I, you know, Mason's familiar with this, is that we believe simple and simple elegant solutions. Uh, complex is easy. We'll talk about sophistication and complex later. So we want to overcome this idea, and we can go back to the slide deck, that we need more money, that there's something going on in our organization that's usually blocking the flow or preventing us from having really high quality services or slowing down the time it takes to get something done. And when we can figure out those little tips and tricks, we can usually flip the system without needing a lot more money. So this is, but this is all mindset. The minute you jump to more money, you don't have the curiosity or the tenacity to go figure out what's going on in the system. So we don't want to jump to more money as one of the solutions. So again, I would create this list for people. When they would come in with ideas, I'd be like, let's just pause here. Let's, let's go a little deeper. Uh, the next one, and this is seven, is this idea that we need uh, more data. So let me ask you this. Here's uh, some questions. Any, I'm sure many of you have been down to Arches. A uh, great area. And here's some facts about arches. Uh, over 2,000 documented arches. Uh, the highest point in arches is like 50, over 5,600 feet. You can see all the data points, how many species of plants there are, yada, yada, yada. And we can put a lot of data points here. And then I want you to look at this picture of arches. And even though I can't see it, I know it's beautiful just having been there. Those data points don't reflect the true beauty of arches. You know, you can't capture this in data. So why, why do I share this with you? Well, we have often this mindset and even more so today, I think some of the biggest traps we fall into in our organizations is this jump to more data. We believe the more data we have, the deeper our understanding of reality will be. But somehow reality will reveal itself if we just had more data. But all data are, are facts and figures. They're just words and numbers. That's all data is. And when we can flip our mindset, because I, I've seen organizations set up massive data dashboards or they're data driven, or they do performance management systems, and they'll spend endless energy time setting up the data. You on the IT side are probably had to set up dashboards for people and things like that. And then when you look at their trend over time, if they're any better off, the answer is usually no, maybe a 1%, 2% improvement. And why is that? Because our understanding of reality isn't just revealed because facts and figures show up in front of us. Uh, and we could spend just two hours just on this topic because it's so troublesome for me. But the real insight comes from when we ask the right questions, right? We ask the right questions, like that system slide that I showed you, A, B, C, D, E. When we ask the question, is the system working well together? What's going on in the system that's breaking it down, that's limiting our ability? That's very different than, geez, how do I, you know, where do I need more money? So when you look at the biggest breakthroughs we've had in science, um, like theory of relativity, which I use all the time, Einstein didn't even look at observable data until I actually had spent years asking this question, what would it be like to travel on a beam of light? And he thought, and he asked Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, all of the great, even now discussions on quark theory and all that stuff comes from people asking questions, the ability to think. And if I had just like one wish for humanity is that this idea that we can only do things if we have a data scientist telling us what to do. People have so much power in their own brains. If we can train them and train ourselves, me included, I'm a work in process, to cut through the noise, to ask the fewest amount of questions so that we can have the insight. I'm not interested in data. I don't want a data-driven organization. I want insight. I want to know where is my leverage point in the system. And that comes through knowledge and thinking. And so I use data. I use data all the time. 
but hope, and I'm not saying I'm perfect with this. It's what I'm, all of this, I'm striving to live. But we want to retrain ourselves that just setting up the latest, fanciest, you know, visual tableau, and we use tableau, but that's not going to solve it for us. It becomes a, an issue of where, where do we need to really think? So an example, there was a big effort a few years ago, um, the legislature did a big appropriation for criminal courts and juvenile justice reform, basically our criminal justice system. A, a multi-million dollar project to set up this massive data system to collect data from everyone on everything. In fact, I've seen some people recommend re recently uh, national that the answer to COVID is to set up more data systems. <laughs> what was really interesting when you looked at all the data, we, you know, they spent like tons of time setting up servers, uh, setting up like the data protocols so that you'd have continuity and SOPs for data collection. But nobody was asking the A, B, C, D, E question. Where are we having the biggest problems in criminal courts, juvenile justice? Why are people getting stuck in the system and not moving through? And when we asked that question, it became very clear. It was the, the judge, the decision that judge made either would set somebody free or send them down a path of sentencing, which is a whole very fundamentally different path. And if we don't have the right information for that judge, when the judge needs it, everything else falls apart. And if we can't get that right, the system breaks. So this becomes a mechanism for focusing. Theory of constraints is about learning to think clearly and to focus, because again, we have that limited time and attention. And when that happens, then we can say, okay, we really need to make sure that any data we collect is relevant to the judge. And what are the questions the judge needs to be able to answer to make a good decision? Now we can have a meaningful discussion about what data to collect, what's the most important data, where do we focus, let that set that up quickly. And then we can worry about, you know, all the other billion pieces of data we need to collect. This country has spent billions on data systems, in my mind, without the impact that our citizens deserve. So we want to, again, use data appropriately, but jumping to it on its own won't solve it. Next one, more reorganization. I won't spend tons of time on this, but uh, <laughs> this idea that we can move chairs on the deck of the Titanic and somehow make things better is silly. Reorgs, and I've, you know, had to be part of, I mean, I've been reorg myself. So it's, it's not that they're bad by themselves. It's just that moving the problem around isn't going to fix it. So we have this mindset. Usually this is what it is. If I need, I need to control the resources. If I can control the resources and have ownership, all of them, then the problem will be fixed. And I'm not saying there's not a time and point for that, but if I can't fix the underlying problem that's creating the conflict between the two groups or the multiple groups or why there's not really good, um, what we would call synchronizing the resources in the process flow, moving the org chart isn't going to solve what's happening. In my opinion, all the values created on the front line, people like me, we were overhead. And if we can't figure out how to make it easier for the folks on the front line to do their job, a reorg up here is only going to disrupt them and it doesn't necessarily fix the problem. Um, we've seen this a lot in a phenomenon called social determinants of care. The idea that, which is true, if you're low income or have other social challenges, um, you know, your healthcare will suffer. And there was a play with the big healthcare organization say, hey, this is an issue. We're going to take 4% of all the budgets for social service programs um, in the state and we'll take that over. It sounds like, hey, really, but think about, it. is that really going to fix it? Because they still wouldn't own, let's say, UTA transportation, because that wasn't part of the state's program. They're still not going to own HUD, which is housing vouchers. You'll never have a program that owns everything. It won't happen. And even if you did, you'll still have silos, because you'll still have a person who's a specialist in housing and a person who's specialist in transportation. And the question is, how do you synchronize services? How do you create harmony regardless of where the resources are? And then after you figure that out, maybe you still want to do a regal work to cement and reinforce and to solidify. But the harder work is figuring out how to synchronize, how to align, how to break conflicts, why people aren't acting in the best interest. So one of the largest banks in Israel has been doing some work on their IT system based off a lot of our work. And there's the budget people, and then there's the IT people. You guys may feel this. And there's always conflict there. And in some cases, we've seen organizations where 
you know, they want to take over the IT, budget wants to take over the IT, or everyone wants to centralize, or they want to decentralize, and nothing gets fixed because we've never solved the underlying problem. So just be mindful, just jump, jump to that. Um, let's go to this technology. Let's spend some time here because we are in a tech group. Uh, this idea that I need more technology. Now, being a blind person, I rely on technology to access your sighted world, right? I use a lot of adaptive technology. So, you know, I, it can be incredibly powerful. And we're in the new day and age of technology. So it's not that it's bad. But we often believe we just need a new tool, a new capability, one new software, one new upgrade, one new change order, and that our problem will be solved. And I know in the agile world, between your epics and your user stories, you're really trying to solve problems for people. But sometimes the business even can really lose its way on this. And we kind of forget what we're trying to solve in the first place. And what we really want to do is solve and understand the underlying business problem. What's the policy? What's the breakdown in the process? What's the problem with the measurement system? What's the significant primary problem for the consumer we're actually trying to solve? And let's get really, really clear on that. So let me give you another example. Um, in government, there's these massive IT systems all across the country called eligibility systems. And it's to determine if people are eligible for like Medicaid or food stamps, which are now called SNAP, things like that. And there's also systems called man Medicaid management information systems. Billions and billions are spent on these systems. When uh, there was a, a state to name nameless and they spent $200 million on a new eligibility system. And the new eligibility system promised to be cutting edge technology. It was a rules-based system. So you could input all this complicated data or comp not complicated, but all these facts about the customer income, household composition, stick it in and it would run the rules across multiple programs and spit out what the answer was. You know, here's the person's eligible for this. And by the way, the people, the frontline were working out of five different legacy systems. So this promised to integrate all the systems into one. So $200 million system, what do you think? Did it solve the right problem? Well, here's the reality of this. Um, the system didn't fix the real problem. And that was this. They didn't have huge issues with accuracy per se, and the rules base can maybe help with that. But number one, the policies around all these programs were too complex. So my first thing is fix the policies. But yeah, you know, they didn't have control of that. That's a federal issue. But here's what they didn't fix. It takes about 30 to 40 days in some cases, sometimes even longer, should never take that long to make a decision if somebody's eligible or not. So we call that the elapsed time, the total time it was to make a decision. So let's give that 30 days. If you actually had all the information from a client and you just sat down to make the decision, it'd probably take you 30 minutes. So this $200 million IT system wasn't shaving time off the 30 days, which was made up of a lot of wait time, just the pro product just sitting there waiting to be worked on. All it did was focus on the 30 minutes. So now an employee versus entering data and buy systems enters it to one, it runs the rules, it tells people what they're eligible for and boom. And now we've taken something from 30 minutes to 26 minutes, who cares? The flow where real work is getting stuck, the A, B, C, D, E concept, not addressed because IT doesn't, not UIT, but sometimes IT systems hide that workflow. Imagine if you're in a manufacturing plant, you can actually see the work go. But when you're in IT systems, the work's hidden. It's behind the scenes. You can't see it pile up. You don't know where the constraints are. You don't know where the time delays are. You don't know the wait time. So the challenge in all this is if you don't know the questions to ask or, or even to start looking at flow, people will jump to new IT systems. And the other downside is the men at hardwires, as you all know, all the problems in the flow into the IT. So now you get two years of backlog change orders from the front line saying, this doesn't work, we hate this, we hate this. And I've seen systems time and time after again, implement massive IT systems and their performance at the end of the day is actually worse. When you look at the cost per unit or the cost per um, decision is actually worse after the IT because when you look at the, the ROI, it, it's just can't justify it. So IT is a tool, but what's the real problem we're solving? What's the real, and I always start with the customer. In this case, what's the real problem for the customer? They don't care if it's rules-based. They don't care if there's five legacy systems. They need a decision now. 
I'm in or I'm out. I'm eligible or I'm not eligible. It's taking me 45 days. I need it done in 10 days. What's blocking that? Then let's have a discussion about the flow, the policy, the measures, et cetera. Then we bring IT in to enhance and amplify our solution to lock it in. And that's where it can be incredibly powerful. So there's a lot of reasons sometimes we jump to IT. These are examples I've used from pulling multiple endless business cases for IT projects, cutting edge technology, modernization. We wanna upgrade legacy systems. We wanna go digital, well-meaning, but none of these are specific or clear on the problem we're solving for the customer. I always say, you have to solve the primary problem for your primary customer if you wanna break through. Everything else is noise. It's secondary, it's tangential, it's nice, it's keeping up with the Joneses, it's not a breakthrough. So it's really basic. What's the problem for the customer? <laughs> we define value as removing a significant limitation for our customer. What's blocking the customer for achieving what they want to achieve, to do what they want to do? What's holding them back? How do we remove that limitation? And IT, when done well, can be incredibly powerful. Did I miss any more slides on that? No. Any questions or thought on the IT piece? Because it's you guys are IT folks, and it's powerful. But we can get so caught up in how do we set up our PMO office, and how many people are you know certified in this or certified in this, and then we can set up. You know, we can be, and it's, we have to do those things. I'm not saying we don't, I mean, not saying you have to, those are important tactics. And we can be really good about setting, holding our scrum and our huddle meetings and all those things and they're important. Those are keeping the machine running well, but we have to first start and go way up front. In fact, we learned this the hard way. When we started doing this work in our department of technology here, our first goal was to improve throughput, like the Phoenix project. And we did a lot of single task flow, what we call full kidding. You know, we gave developers everything they needed. We protected their time so they could focus. And we got big jumps of performance and throughput. But we realized we got it backwards because we hadn't done that work up front, what we now call the full engagement model. It's a process we walked through before we even jumped automation. What's the goal of the system? What's the problem for the customer? And it, you know, it can take a couple of days to go through this, but go slow to go fast. Because if you figure that out, front, your IT downstream goes much quicker. What we found and when we started implementing that, a lot of projects didn't need to happen or if they did need to happen, they are much simpler. And you could find a simpler approach than what was being um, considered at the beginning. So those are my thoughts on IT. And, and we got some pretty great progress. Yes. Okay. Kristen, so, I have a question. Yeah. This is Rachel. Yes, Rachel, tell me about you. Where do you, what's your, what do you do? Um, I am a very green scrum master uh, with Circe Dynix, who um, they make uh, library software solutions. Ah, very well, cool. Very cool. Um, you mentioned um, a full uh, a full engagement, call it audit. Uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about more a little bit more about that tool? Sure. Um, and again, this is us having to like redo what we did because we were getting faster but the, you always have to be effective before you're efficient and a lot of times the agile and those things are fantastic uh you know i became a big fan of those things and, and i use what i call huddle meetings when i actually do case management work with child welfare and all that stuff they're really important but we need to first be effective to do the right thing and then do it efficiently to do the right thing the right way and what we sometimes in IT do is jump to doing the right way, but we're not sure if we're doing the right thing. And so it's essentially, um, we start, we have a list of questions. They're basic questions that IT people should be able to, and the business, quite frankly, a lot of this is putting the burden on the business. So they don't just throw crap over to the IT side and say, go automate it, you know, without having to give any thought and then make you guys accountable for it. So one, it slows the business down because they can't launch projects until this is completed, which helps the IT system focus and not cram so many projects down. And there's a whole rule about bad multitasking that we use to, to it, we don't have time today to talk about that. But so it's really to help us understand, and then we put people through it like a workshop almost. Who's your primary customer, for example? So that sounds like pretty basic, but HBO, for example, really interesting. You would think HBO would think that their primary customer is us, the watcher, the viewer. HBO made a very strategic decision that their primary customer was not the consumer, but the filmmaker. 
And if they could set a package for the filmmaker that was really robust and attractive, they could attract the best filmmakers and then get the best films, which then as a byproduct gets more viewers. So we ask basic questions and we all think, we say it's obvious who our primary customers. In many cases it is, but not always. We ask the question, what's really the goal of the system? How are you gonna measure if this Medicaid management information system that will cost $200 million of taxpayer money, how do you know after that's implemented, how do you know if you're better, faster, cheaper? What's your throughput rate today? How many decisions or provider enrollments are you making today? How many can this do? What's your cost per decision today? Let's look at the cost comparison after. What's the quality of your decision? Do you have rework? Are there you know, a lot of ambiguity and we have to like go back and redo the whole case because we got it wrong the first time. So we were always want to kind of do basic baselining. What's the quality? How much of it can you do? What is the cost? Because IT has its own costs and those become kind of hidden in the system, right? We just assume the cost of it. But we really want to get clear that this has to provide specific value for the business, which should be providing significant value for the customer. So how are we making services better for our customers, faster, cheaper, more innovative, et cetera, for the customer? So we go through this process first. And when people are solid on that, then we can ask additional questions. Is this something that's off the shelf or do we have to customize, right? Great. So it's a basics. And then when we're solid on that, then we can say, okay, go forth and automate or don't. And then, then you get into the place of epics and agile or DevOps or whatever you want to do to implement. But imagine taking on a DevOps project where you can now just like automate like this, but you're automating everything that isn't a value. So you're doing more of the wrong thing. So that's, a, it's a, and maybe when we're done, I can give you guys, let me remember, we'll send you the, the questions. The questions are sim seem simple, but there is, you know, like the A, B, C, D, E question, you know, how is the IT fixing that? Because those are all issues of flow, how the parts of the system are working together. And if you don't have that figured out ahead of time, we actually build with the team what's called a system map. So everyone can visualize how the system should be working, how the parts work together. We implement what's called rules of flow. Um, there's points in the system where if I have a handoff, I don't want to have anything handed off unless all the information that the next person needs is there. So how do I make sure in my IT system that happens? So we build up, we make sure we're solving the right problems strategically. We make sure the flow is solid. We have all of those things figured out. Then we can go ahead and, and automate. I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. And as Randy uh, points out, um, that the full engagement model Mm -hmm. This process will take a one or two day in person yeah. type of well in yeah. people type um, yeah. type dive, but I can see how um, that could eliminate a lot of um, noise. A lot of noise. So there's there's a levels. lot of noise. Okay, because a lot of times, and you know, well, we can just spend some more time on this and you know, that we can bypass some of the later seductive seven, because this is in your world of IT is really important. We try to do a lot of consensus building after the decision to build the IT systems there. And then you do a lot of business requirements and business analysis. But a lot of that, there's not agreement on visually how this, and I'm blind and it's funny. And I like and <laughs> got a visualization of this because just words on paper don't pe help people understand the connection of all the parts. Mm. The A, B, C, D. How, if I'm in juvenile justice and a kid comes into the system, um, I can just do all this crazy complex case management. But if I don't get really clear upfront for this kid um, when the kid should leave, what are the major milestones? What does the handoff look like? How much time should the case manager be spending with the kid each week, which ended up being 12.5 hours and they were spending two hours? If I don't have all that stuff figured out first to hand, I'll just jump into this case management system, which every state has. And a lot of them are, in my mind, don't provide value. They just create like, okay, I can keep case notes now for audit purposes. The customer doesn't care about if we can keep notes on them for audit purposes. Hmm. Right? The kid and the family needs to know what does this kid need to do in the next two weeks to focus on so he or she has a fighting chance of getting out of that place. And so it's these just basic questions we have to work through at the beginning 
so that our IT system is amplifying the solution, but the solution is always a process issue, a policy, a strategy, a measure, something like that that we need to work through and then we can use IT to automate. So I feel very passionate about this. And I'll tell you why. Not only because having run the budget and just, you know, we just only had so much money, but I was being blind. There were some years when I was actually on the form of public assistance. And I wouldn't share that for many years because I had so much shame around it. But my early 20s and kind of stuff, I just couldn't work. I didn't know Braille, you know, because I lost my vision later in life and had to, and it was like it took some time to transition and figure out how to do my life. And I was at the other side of all of these organizations and systems that had all these cool strategic ideas and da 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 da, da. But nothing was moving. Like on the other end of that, it was a nightmare. And you look at the people we serve, and you look at people, let's just take people with disabilities. There hasn't been a substantial jump in employment rates for this population for a long time, despite all the new technology, despite all the new case management systems, despite all the new data systems, despite the data collection at the federal level, despite the reorgs moving into one-stop centers, despite all of the seductive seven, those things haven't moved. And it tells you, if you're not getting a leap in performance, you're solving the wrong problem. You're automating the wrong solution. So I will leave you guys to think about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, then, you know, I, I won't spend time on the, uh, too much on the others. I will just touch on the last three, or we believe we need a new strategy. We need to trade people. We need to do, uh, you know, more accountability in our systems. And not, again, those aren't bad things, but let's just take strategy, for example. We think we need a new idea. Anyone in an organization where your group comes up with a new strategic plan every year? Been there, done that. Um, strategy is just an idea. It's the direction of a solution. Uh, all the innovation happens in execution. Tesla is an amazing example of this idea. Accelerate the adoption of electric cars. He's not changing his strategy every year. It's all in execution. You know, the big strategy is to have a supply chain that he owns it vertically integrated. He owns the supply chain. And that is a nightmare to work through. If you want to mine your own lithium in the United States and not have it imported, you've got to freaking out figure out a new piece a way to actually mine lithium out of the Nevada deserts, which he did. Those are all execution and operational issues. So when you see these organizations jumping from strategic plan, it's like, guys, it's not about a new idea. If your idea is good enough, freaking execute. The innovation happens in the execution. The flow issues, the how do you mine lithium out of the Nevada desert? You know, how do you as Tesla actually double the sales of cars? This article came out this week and not have a problem with chip processing, which every other car manufacturing had. Why? Because Tesla decided we're gonna conjure up all the parts that we have and reconfigure our software to make it work with the parts we have so it won't slow us down. Those are execution issues. That's not a new strategy. So just, I'm always scared when organizations are like, hey, we got a new strategic plan. I'm like, well, what happened in the last year? Did you get a big improvement? No, okay, new ideas aren't gonna help you then. You got, you've got failure in execution. So. I feel so strong about this stuff because even if you're in government or nonprofit work or private sector, jobs are on the line. People, what they need is on the line if you're private sector or not. People need a product, a service. Uh, in government, we extract money from taxpayers. We better show an ROI for that. And part of the journey of breakthrough is learning what to stop doing. And if we train ourselves to stop doing those things, we can start opening our capacity up and our time and our mental um, capacity to the things that we really should do that will make the biggest difference for the people we serve. So I will leave you guys with that because I don't want to take up too much time. Huh? What training you want? Well, do I have time? What, when do I go till one? Yeah. Oh, I still have 10 more minutes. Okay, I'll go through these, these last two. We start strategy. Let me go through more training and accountability then. And training's not like a bad thing. I've done trainings. We're kind of in a training, kind of right now. But training is this, we have this illusion um, that if, if we just gave people more information, they would change their behavior, right? So we have this, this false assumption in many cases that we mistake knowing for doing. And in reality, we wanna make it natural and easy for people to make the choices we want them to make because it's naturally built into the system. People naturally make that decision, not because we train them. The system's creating all these conflicts and makes it difficult. So now we're training them 
to override what the system does. We want the system to produce the outcomes naturally and intuitively for people. So here's some examples. Here's a picture of a, a garbage can. This is a true example. Um, it used to be when you go to fast food, they'd have the rectangular, and some may still, the rectangular garbage cans. And so you have your tray, your food, and people will go to throw their food away and, and many times accidentally throw the whole tray away. They just don't think about it, throw the whole tray in the garbage can. So they put this sign up, please don't throw your, gar your tray into the garbage can. But somebody finally thought through this and said, wait, how do I mistake prove this? Let's make the garbage can lids round. So it's impossible for the rectangular garbage tray to go into the circular garbage can. That's what we mean here. It's just giving people more information. And if it's not changing, it's not. There's something going on in the system, a policy, a measure, a flow issue that's blocking people. Here's a couple examples as well. Um, we live in the Utah and it's very dry here and not just here, many, you know, the whole Western United States. So this is not even from Utah. This is everywhere in the Western, we're really dry. So a lot of campaigns to conserve water, right? Lots of educational campaigns, conserve water, conserve water. Had, had make a big, just didn't make a big difference. Water conservation has not really made it a dent and water use in the state of Utah or in other states, Nevada, Arizona, actually, it's they've done some good stuff, but why? Well, because water rates, I hate to tell you this, at least in Utah, are really cheap. They're subsidized by property tax, sales tax. And so if water is really cheap, it's very easy to overuse. So I can hear an ad to like conserve water, but I'm only paying one-tenth of a cent per gallon as compared to $4 for a gallon of milk <laughs> or for a gallon of gas, but I'm paying a tenth of a cent for a gallon of water. It's very easy to overconsume a resource that seems abundant where I don't feel any pain on that. The harder thing is how do you change the pricing so people they get automatic feedback that this they're overconsuming. Not popular, much harder to do. Looking at the next slide, we all know we should eat healthy. We all should know should we exercise more? We should eat less sugar. We should sleep more. Are we all doing that? No. Why? There's a lot of reasons. It's inconvenient. We don't have enough time. It's cheaper to buy cheap food than it is to buy high quality food. There's a lot of things in the system um, that make it very difficult for people just to do this. So telling people more puts the burden on them. And what we want to do is put the burden back on ourselves is to say, what's blocking them? Why, if people want to do the right thing, if people are going to act in a way that's in their best interest and they're not, what's broken in the system that's preventing them from doing that? And then after I figure that out, yeah, go train them. But I've seen this in like child welfare reform across the country, family focused. Hey, all you caseworkers that are overwhelmed, that are burned out, we want you to focus now on the whole family. And even though the system doesn't support you in that, the time you have to work with the family, the resources you have, how we design the flow doesn't support you, we're gonna train you. And all it does is put the burden on them instead of fixing the A, B, C, D, E issues, what policy issues are blocking them. There's a lot that goes into that. So fundamentally, it's about taking ownership and not shifting the blame to or the responsibility to other people, but fixing the system. Deming once said a poorly designed system will beat a good person anytime. So there's, when you see massive issues going on, you know, there's sometimes people who are bad actors, but if you've got just not getting the outcomes you want, just training people won't do it. Something's fundamentally flawed in the system. And then the final one is more blaming and accountability. We believe that our ability to make an impact is limited by somebody else, something else. And that may, I'm not saying that's not true. I mean, we all have limitations. We have bosses we don't like that limit us, or we have, you know, lots of stuff that may make your jobs harder. I'm not putting my head in the sand. But what I am saying is that you don't want to give up your power because number one, the only thing you can control is yourself. And as soon as we shift the blame to our employees or something else, we skip over what we have responsibility over. So we want to substitute this mindset of it's somebody else's fault with, I need to perfect what's already under my stewardship. What do I have stewardship over? How do I help the people in front of me, behind me, above me? How do I do an excellent job there? And then over time, your circle of influence will grow. Uh, this is an interesting one, um, uh, actually a car dealership that uses theory of constraints and he's been incredibly successful. 
And his car dealers with cars, you can either sell volume or margins, right? You can sell more cars or you can sell fewer cars with higher margins. And they were always trying to, you know, they were blaming their staff and they were actually trying to train their sales team. Hey, these are the cars that you can discount. These are the cars you can't. And the salespeople would kind of always get it wrong because there's so many cars to figure out. And this, and the management was always blaming the sales team. The sales team got discouraged. They had high turnover, bad morale. And finally, when the mindset hit management that they need to take ownership of this, they made a simple change. We call it making a physical change, right? When you're trying to train people, it just, you gotta make something actually physical. And this is where IT can be amazing because it can make the physical change to mistake proof or whatever. But in this scenario, they said cars in this part of the lot can be discounted. Cars in this part of the lot cannot be discounted. The customer didn't know, but it's very easy now for the sales folks to know which cars they could discount, which cars they couldn't. So this friction and the blaming and the finger pointing just went away because they solved the real problem, right? And so there's so much power I think people have in themselves. I, I just believe in people and I think people have so much potential, but they overlook it because they start giving more power to the people around them. And again, people around us affect us, but we can't control them. The only thing we can do is impact the work we do. And then hopefully over time, you know, make the world a better place because we expand our, our little corner of the world. So those are the seductive seven. I encourage people always to start by stopping. Um, do, just doing more of the same isn't going to get you a breakthrough. Being busier isn't going to get you a breakthrough. Learning how to say no to the things that don't matter. So you can say yes to the very few changes. Fixing C, for example, in, the, in that diagram. So you have the capacity to really focus on those leverage points and understand systems thinking all these things are so important, but it starts with knowing what to stop. And these are indicators of things to just be mindful of. Um, and then if you can learn to stop those, you, you can start searching for more breakthrough results. So there we go. 1258. 1258. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's well really bad. good, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Kristen. This was amazing. Um, I'm glad we recorded it because I'm going to go watch it back like three more times and take <laughs> extra notes. <laughs> There's a lot there, but just mostly trust your intuition. Solve the primary problem for your primary customer. Just anchor in that. The rest is noise. <laughs>